No? Before we begin, though, let's go to Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. And Dan, would you mind directing our minds in that prayer? <clears throat> our Father in Heaven, we thank Thee so much for all the very many blessings that we receive from Thee. And we thank Thee mostly, Heavenly Father, for the blessings that we have in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Your Son. We pray, Heavenly Father, now that You'll be with us and, and help us to learn the things that we need to know to glorify Thee while we're here. And we ask Thee, Heavenly Father, to uh, help us to apply the things that we learn uh, to our lives today and through the study of your prophet Daniel. And we ask Thee to be merciful unto us. And as we learn of things that we do that are wrong or leave undone things we need to do, as we repent of those things, we ask for Thy forgiveness. All these things we ask through the, uh, Thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, what I'd like to do is back up just a little bit, and we'll um, read a few verses here. We left off last week in our discussion at verse 25 there. But what I'd like to do is to back up to let's go back to verse 17, because beginning at verse 17, we have Daniel stepping in in trying to answer Nebi, uh, ne answer Belshazzar there, what he saw written on the wall and exactly what the meaning of that was. So, Dale, we'll start with you, and if you would read for us beginning in verse 17 of Daniel 5, and read down to verse 19, please. <laughs> then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O King, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory, and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he ex executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he so wished, he on. put down. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading down my Bible. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, I'm glad you said that. Then, if you would. So it's, it's, yeah, we should have, never mind. Then, go ahead and start at verse 20 now and take us through 22, please. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened and tried, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. And, oh, boy, 29? I need some coffee this morning, don't I? I don't know. <laughs> Where were we? You, might be able to you need to read 20, 22 now. Okay. okay. Stop there. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not, uh, not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. Okay, let's pause for just a moment. We'll continue our reading here. But let's remind ourselves of what we're looking at within this text here now. Um, what is, who has is Daniel just reminded Belshazzar of and the great lesson of his life? Exactly. He's reminding Belshazzar here of the lessons learned by Nebuchadnezzar when the Lord humbled Nebuchadnezzar and put him into the beast of the field. And this was a great lesson because he learned, especially look at 21, till he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But then when you look at the beginning of 22, you find the heart of the problem at Bel of Belshazzar's problem. He says, but you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. Which tells us Belshazzar knew what had happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He knows. Yeah, there's, there's an interesting comment, it seems to me, that all the time <coughs> that Nebuchadnezzar was living in the fields like a baby in the fields, <coughs> God protected him. Yes. You would think that if you moved from a luxurious life that Nebuchadnezzar had and then lived like an animal, he would not survive. And yet he did survive. You know, that's an excellent So there's point. a lesson there. There yeah. should be a lesson to Bel to Belshazzar. Because yeah. it wasn't simply he went out to the field and his servants brought him food. No. He ate of the grass of the field. I don't know how that does to one's stomach, but it can't be good. That's a good point, though. And other animals. 
not protect them from other animals as well. That's a good point. It's a very good point. Any other thoughts about that? Um, Belshazzar, as we talked about, could possibly have been the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. I think it was, or I think it was, that's right, grandson, possibly Nebuchadnezzar. But here he identifies him as being you know, his son or that is directly related from him. And he knew all the story of Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, how could you not know the story about the great Nebuchadnezzar who went mad and lived out in the field for possibly seven years? You know, it, it would have been known. So, let's start at verse 23 now, and Ms. Forbes, let's jump over to you, and if you would, start at verse 23, and let's read 23 and 24, please. But I set it up myself against the Lord of the heavens, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines, have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. Okay, let's talk about something here for just a moment, these two verses there. Notice there, he talks about the sin of Belshazzar, in that he's brought the, 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 the sacred vessels, the sanctified vessels, from the house of the Lord. And they who were, were heathens, I mean, they weren't, weren't even Jews, they weren't even priests, obviously, they were drinking from them, drunk from them. And in the course of drinking from them, they praised gods of silver, gods of gold, bronze, and iron, gods of wood and stone, the very gods you do not see or hear or know. He says, and the God who holds your breath in his hands in all of his ways you've not glorified. All right, so this was essentially, you know, why the writing of the wall was coming upon him. Because he not only rejected the existence of God, but he went, he went farther than Nebuchadnezzar did. You think about it, he, he, he's taken the vessels from the holy temple of God, and he's drinking from those vessels, and he's praising false gods using the vessels that were designed to praise Jehovah God. So I, I think you know, when we look at this picture there, it, one might say that the level of Belshazzar's sin, if you would, was, was greater than Nebuchadnezzar's. Or God saw Belshazzar as not learning, and Nebuchadnezzar as being able to learn. And there's a third possibility, too. We'll talk about that soon. Go ahead, Dan. I kind of see a correlation between this and the Apostle Paul's uh, in Athens. Mm -hmm. And the Aragopagus. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Because um, he talks about the, he says, I want to talk to you about the idol to the, or to the, I want to talk about the unknown God. And they had an idol to the unknown God, lest they forget and offend, you know, a God. That's right. But, but he also named all the gods that they had the altar still to. Yep. That's this, and then, and then the real God was mentioned. That's right. That's right. Well, you think about it, they, they would erect idols to gods and, and temples and statues be made out of silver and gold. Some would have been out of bronze and iron. You know, some wood stone. It could be some of the statues could have been could have been a part and piece of wood and stone, iron and bronze, you know, in order to, to create the whole of the statue. And what is interesting is, is which do not see or hear or know. Jehovah God, they did know because the case in point of Daniel's interaction with Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's interaction with Nebuchadnezzar, they'd seen all. Any other thoughts? Chief? Yeah. Well, there's that mischief. Uh, not even Nebuchadnezzar stooped to dishonoring the vessels which had been brought back from Judah. Yeah. He put them in his storehouse. Yeah. So he, he, there's no indication that he stopped them. And then he, did, that he dishonored them by using them like Belshazzar did. Yeah. So each generation of degradation gets worse. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, there's no record that he did it. But, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's problem is just he just didn't recognize Jehovah God as being the only and great God. Um, well, that goes back to verse 22 as well, is what Gene's saying there. Mm -hmm. When <clears throat> Daniel says, But you, his son Belshazzar, uh, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. Uh, Fool, one of the commentators, makes a comment that uh, what Daniel is saying here is, You're even worse than your father. Yeah. And that's kind of that's the way I see that as well. Yeah. I have generations of people. 
like he says, it just your degradation just increases with each generation. Yeah. And so does our sin uh, on an individual basis. The, the, the first time that you uh, sin, it's difficult and it hurts you. Mm -hmm. But then the second time it's a little easier and the third time it's a little easier. So our degradation, degradation. 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 There you go. <laughs> gets uh, gets easier and easier and worse and worse. It, it, it's uh, it's about like what we're saying here. Every time you said degradation, it got worse, right? Yes, it, is. <laughs> I, it, it, de it degraded as I kept. Where you go? <clears throat> Follow the history of the Jews. Mm -hmm. When you go from the last part of Joshua to the second chapter of the of Judges, mm -hmm. in one generation, that's right. They forgot everything. Yep. So is there rose a rose a generation that did not know Joshua and is in all the things that had been exactly. done for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think what one another lesson you kind of learned from this is that Nebuchadnezzar didn't have the benefit of Belshazzar of having any foreknowledge of God. And he learned it firsthand. Well, you think about when God teaches a lesson to a person, any person in, who, who is aware of that lesson is in a sense, if you think about it, accountable for knowing that lesson. And in this case, point, Belshazzar knew the lesson Nebuchadnezzar had learned, yet he turned against it. It's, it's, imagine if you have an individual who never becomes a Christian. All right? They're still accountable unto God, we understand that. But now let's turn the tables a little bit. They obey the gospel, and they have children, and they teach it to their children, but yet their children never follow. It's kind of like Belshazzar here. The lessons are right there in front of them. The lessons are right there before them. But yet, Belshazzar chooses not to listen. And he, in a way, becomes, well, there's no hope for him. And, and the other thing I mentioned, there was three things a while ago to consider, too, with this, is that it was time for the kingdom to change in fulfillment of the prophecy of God. And God prophesied that knowing, you know, what would happen. And Belshazzar is fulfilling that prophecy by rejecting God. And God's about to take it away from him and give it to the Medes and the Persians as Daniel saw in Nebuchadnezzar's initial dream. All right, any thoughts? You know, when it says, I don't know, I don't even know the word to use, whether it's arrogance or what, but it said you have lifted up yourself against the Lord. You know, yes. Yourself, he's on that heat, you know. That's right. By taking the golden vessels from the temple, and or the ones that were pulled from the temple, and drinking from them, they did exactly that. Lifted themselves up against Jehovah God. Now, I'm kind of straying here a little bit, but what New Testament character essentially did the same thing. But yet he was spared. The Apostle Paul? Do you think about that? Jesus says, you know, why are you kicking against the goats? You know, and it's also why persecutest thou me? You know, the difference was, and here's the fundamental difference. Um, Paul had been serving God faithfully up until the, the, the change of the covenant. You know, and he, pers he was still on that same path. That was still his law and everything. And once he learned the truth, he changed. Belshazzar wasn't going to learn. Wasn't going to change. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes, One other thing. If we get further down in this chapter, uh, at, at some point Belshazzar began to listen to James. Yes. And Daniel told him initially, I cannot be bought. Yeah. And that's, that gave him some credibility, I think, in the eyes of Belshazzar. Because here's somebody who's going to tell you what I want to hear, but I can't buy him off. Right. He said, give your, give your gifts to somebody else. Don't give them to me. But I will tell you the answer. That's a very good point. That's a good point. Similar case in point with the um, story of I may have in um, Jehoshaphat when they went to battle, yeah. and um, Jehoshaphat wanted to hear a prophet from God. He had calls for Micaiah at the time. And, um, you know, Micaiah told him what exactly he didn't want to hear. <laughs> but he wanted the truth from Micaiah, and he heard it. Okay. Well, let's step now into verse 25. This is where we actually left off a couple weeks ago in our study. And let's see. Miss Florence, you read Miss Betty. Would you mind reading for us? We're going to read 26 through 29, please. Or 25 through 29, that is. Oh, I needed to skip 25. <laughs> and this is the inscription that was written. Meeny, meeny, tekel. 
The parson? Yeah. Come here. This is the interpretation of each word, meaning God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tackle, you have weighed in the balance of your wanting. Her, hers, mm -hmm. your kingdom have been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Beelzebub, Beelzebub gave the command that they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Okay. Well, let's back up now here to verse 25, and let's look at this for just a moment. As we've already seen earlier in the text with, with the writing on, of the wall, there are the inscriptions that the Dan, the, or Daniel now explaining, here's what the inscriptions read. It said, Mine, Mine, to kill, to kill a parson. Or as Rhonda has taught her kids in her class, Mini, mini, tickle your parson. It's a way of remembering. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so that's that's the writing on the wall there. Okay. So Daniel is about to explain the interpretation of it. Now, before we do that, you may have some footnotes within your Bible that may give some literal meanings behind these words. I'll share it with you what I have in mind. The the term mine literally means untying knots, and so in verse sixteen. So we get, um, let me put verse 16 down there. Probably meant 26. Yeah, 26 there. All right, and then, so literally untying knots. Then 13, where he uses the term, uh, oh, so I'm just I'm looking at this wrong. <laughs> that doesn't help, does it? All right, 25. Okay, literally, boy, that makes better sense now. Literally, a mina as in 50 shekels, from the verb to number. All right, and then when he says to kill, literally a shekel from the verb to weigh. And then when he says a parson, literally, and half shekels from the verb to divide. Okay, so when you look at what he's saying there, and Daniel's about to explain it, the first one there is simply God has numbered your kingdom, Menet. Okay, um, it's like counting it out, numbering certain many and so many. All right. God has numbered your kingdom. And look at the last one here. He has counted it as being completed. Finished. Okay. The days thereof are numbered. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. That finish yeah. it because keep in mind he used many, many twice here. Yes. He's numbered your kingdom. He's also numbered the days that you will continue to exist. Good point. Two different two different things there are numbered. That's a very good point. The, the days of the kingdom and the days of his existence. It's a very good, especially his reign. You think about kingdom, you think about reign as well. And of course, his life there with that too. All right, any thoughts about that? The very next verse. The very, the very next verse. Yes. Ends the, ends it, verse 30. That's right. That very night. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't make it. <laughs> Not even a good night's sleep. Yeah. Remember, I think we pointed out last week that at this very moment, the Persian army had seized, sieged Babylon. And they, they were surrounding the camp. And here they were throwing this party, you know, as if they're gods. And, you know, and you think about this, it may be the reason why they were drinking uh, from the, the, the vessels of Jehovah and praising their gods. They may have been petitioning hell. You know, and they're not from Jehovah, but from their own gods. Could have been, you know. Well, much the fact that Babylon <clears throat> was a very advanced city in those days. Yes. Had extensive sewers and... Uh, Water courses underneath the city, and that's where the enemy had come. Yep. They were in the palace at the very time they were having this party. Waiting on them. That's right. Their embarrassed <laughs> lifestyle became their the lifestyle became their death style. Well, you think about it. If, you know, if you're going to attack someone, wait until they're drunk. That could have been. You know, of course, they didn't quite make it that far. <laughs> uh, I mean, there there was a lot of reveling going on for sure. But that's a good point. The enemy was already in there. They, I mean, when he says that night, literally, that's how close they were to the verge of destruction and just ignoring it. Yeah. But there he says that very night. Yeah. Yeah. Not a couple weeks later. I mean, it, yeah. Very yeah. night. It's a good point. Good point. All right, now let's look at 27 here for a moment. All right, the term to kill. All right. What are the thought? First off, Daniel says, literally, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting, okay? The, um, oh, 
I read something here from Clark I want to share with you on this one. Dale, go ahead. You got anything? Well, here it is. Scott makes this comment. He said, uh, he said, this signified that the king was weighed in the impartial balances of divine justice and found deserving of the deepest condemnation as base metal and counterfeit money are detected by the scale of being weighed and found deficient. Okay. That's a very good explanation of that. Tikel means essentially weighing, is, is the idea there behind that. And um, what, Dale, Dale, you made a very good point there with that in that commentary because you think about it, if you're going to, um, let's say if you were a dealer in precious metal, metals, uh, better yet, you lived there in the gold rush days, and you've gone out and you've panned and you found a handful of, of gold. And so you go to an individual because you want to sell it to them. And they put it on their scales. Now their scales would have to be perfectly balanced and calibrated so that when it weighed out 16 ounces of gold, it was 16 ounces of gold. But if you had an unbalanced scale, that what is truly 16 ounces of gold could weigh 14 ounces. And so you would pay the person based on 14 ounces of gold and not 16 ounces. So then imagine now you and a hundred of your, your buddy, buddies has just you know exchanged their gold for money, and you find out a week later that the scales were off, and you've been cheated several hundred dollars. You imagine the, 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 uh, the how how upset you would be. And um, when we look at this situation, that's exactly what he's saying. He has been, except in this case of point, it's not about an un uncalibrated scale. He's being compared to the perfection, and he's found wanting. He's found lacking. He's put on the scales and he's coming up short. Uh, as it says right here, found wanting. Any thoughts about that? All right, now the next one, you, you see 25 is very clear, mene, mene, tekel. All right, but then it uses the word of parson. And then 28, though, we see a different word, perez. And there was, this is kind of the question that we had last week on this. What was, what was the difference between the parson and perez there? And there are a couple of things to note here on this. He's, in Daniel's explanation there of this, he says Perez, right here, means your kingdom has been divided. Literally, the word Perez there means this. Back up there, one I'm looking. Actually, a parson. Here's the word. Literally, the word a parson means um, and half shekels from the verb to divide. Okay? to divide. Hash it from the verb to divide there, according to this right here. And then when we jump over in Clark's commentary, when he talks about this and laying forth this particular explanation, he makes the statement that far as mine to kill for right, well let me back up a little bit. He says it should be observed that each word stands for a short sentence. Mine signifies numeration, to kill weighing, and perez division. And so the Aramaic translation, and so the Ar Arabic translates them. He gives it there, and I'm going to try to read all that. <laughs> all the ancient versions, except the Syriac, reads the word simply, mene tekel fares, as they are explained in the following verse. Without the repetition of mene, and without the conjunction, here we go, vol, and plural termination there of perez. In other words, what he's saying, if I read it, if I understand it right, the parson is simply a variation of the word Perez. It's simply a variation. And he's, according to what he says, some translations, whenever they're rendering verse 25, they simply render it as Daniel explains it, Mene, Tekel, and Perez. Okay. But the parson is a, basically uh, just a variation of the word Perez. And when he uses the term Perez here, he's using it, you think about it, he's identifying it as your kingdom has been divided and given to whom? Means of the Persians. Means of the Persians, exactly. Any thoughts, any comments about that? <laughs> Scott also makes a comment here that <clears throat> it's interesting to note that Daniel did not say to Belshazzar, you need to repent, because he, Daniel knew that his doom was already at hand. That's an, that's an excellent point. When um, Jonah went to the king of Nineveh many years earlier, he told, well, essentially, he <laughs> said, you're going to die, and they repented. Yeah. But you're right, no message was given here of repentance, no opportunity to repent as far as that goes either. Well, they said, 
You said already said earlier mm -hmm. that you you know what happened to your to your father or grandfather or Nebuchadnezzar, and you should have learned from that. Yeah. So that's that's the absolute turn away. So what, what inclination would he have to repent of anything? Since he saw what happened to his grandfather and ignored it. That's a good point. He had already turned his back on the yeah. truth. <clears throat> that's true. Then. I think he, he may have had some uh, divine knowledge into his heart, too. Because, you know, he uh, he knew his heart, and he knew what he was thinking, and he knew he wasn't going to repent. Plus, his uh, actions in the past proved that he wasn't going to repent. Right. And uh, I think God at, uh, at any time will accept repentance, but... He can also read your heart. He knows you're not going to repent. He knew he wasn't going to repent and what happens to Well, especially during this time period. Right. You know, where, where God is, is dealing directly with the people there. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh never had a true repentant heart, even, even to the end. He would sway back for a little bit, but his heart would never truly be repentant. Mm -hmm. um, Ahab, not Ahab. Yeah, Ahab. His heart was never repentant. Um, and Jer Jeroboam, when the, in 1 Kings 13, when the young prophet came <laughs> preaching against Jeroboam, Jeroboam for, said for a time, you know, he said, you'll pray that this doesn't come upon me. But he didn't truly repent. And so I, I think that's a good point there. God, God knew back then whether or not he was going to mm -hmm. repent. Whether or not he had a repentant heart, I should say. And um, God would spare him if he would have repented. But he had ignored the truth he had learned. That's a good point. All right, any thoughts? Well, some of the commentaries indicate that uh, the wife of the, his grandmother was actually the queen mm. still in Belzar's uh, reign and that he would uh, that she probably had told him over and over the story of the grandfather I wouldn't doubt that at all yeah being that. a grandmother I know <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a very strong possibility, you know. And how many people from Nebuchadnezzar's court, we know Daniel was still living, how many people in Nebuchadnezzar's court may have tried to talk to Belshazzar, especially when he brought the, the, the vessels in? You know, there's just, it, it probably was simply more than simply the story being known. He probably had advisors who was telling him, don't do it. You know, you need to listen. Possibly, possibly. We don't know. Now, something that's going on in the background here within the nation of Babylon, there's a lot of uprisings going on. And the, the Persians, they're about to take opportunity now to seize the area, to seize the country there. And um, the Medes and the Persians, this is what they're about to do. All right, any thoughts? I think it's uh, really good to be under the New Covenant. Yes. Because uh, under the, under the uh, old law, during the days of the children of Israel, mm -hmm. there were uh, thousands and thousands of them swallowed up by the earth and uh, killed instantly for their disobedience. Yeah. And without a chance to uh, change. That's you know, right. Uh, God, uh, God knew their hearts, and he, uh, and he, he also became tired of their insolence and their. Uh, complaining and griping and stuff and he had enough in, in certain instances and uh, their sins were their demise That's right. and you know under the new law it, it, it is so much better to be able to uh, uh, to be given time you know God uh, as it says over there is, uh, does not he's not slack concerning his promises but he's long suffering to us <coughs> with not wishing that any should perish so he's he's long suffering to us. Exactly. It's and I, I believe all the interaction. If you were to break it down, all the interaction with God, with the people of the world, the people he slayed, the people he killed, was all in the shaping of the world for the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, getting Israel to where it needed to be, and the nations to punish, to raise up whatever needed to be done there. And once the covenant came into effect, you're absolutely right. I mean. I don't see anywhere in the New Testament, with the exception of the very beginning, um, and, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, in that mm -hmm. case in point. And remember when Paul blinded uh, uh, the servant of Sergius Paulus, I believe it's the servant of Sergius Paulus, 
the, the start of the pro council there mm -hmm. blinded him. Okay, we see very those are the, you know very few you know here's an immediate consequence divinely given for your actions. But nowadays, <laughs> and ever since that point, you know if if I do something stupid and sinful that has consequences, I'm gonna face them. Well, those were still uh, under the time when yeah. miracles and actions from God were to prove that He was God. Exactly. I mean, you know, after after we have received uh, the whole Word, mm -hmm. we we no longer read of any of those outside of nature events where God was dealing directly with man. No more miracles. Yeah. And, and such. That's a good point. That's a good point. All right, any thoughts? Any other thoughts about that? I think we have to be careful today because of things that are written before time were written by our learning. And <laughs> we see all these things that happen in the Old Testament, and sometimes we get a little disobedient ourselves. <laughs> you know, that's an excellent point. Because the, the, the wrath of God that's going to come may not come against me while I'm living, but will come against me at the end, without a doubt. And, and the Old Testament shows that to be a certainty. That's an excellent point. If we can trust in His promise to reward us, we can trust in His promise to destroy us. That's right. That's right. Gene? Yeah, just kind of an interesting aside, which has actually no connection to this lesson. When I was a kid, on Sunday afternoons, on the radio, for a couple of hours, there was a program on the, the battle between the Medes and the Persians. You can imagine that. That back in the nineteen thirties. Yeah. Interesting. And here are the two and these are the two kingdoms that are battling over Babylon. Yep. Yep. Battle battle of the Medes and the Persians. Yeah. <laughs> um one 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 little side note then in re re reference to the uh, the lessons learned. I think about what Hebrews chapter two, the first four verses there um, he makes the point that essentially when you get down to verse 3, how shall we escape yeah. if we neglect so great a salvation? And what he does, let's turn over there now. Well, I'll bring it up here real quick. In Hebrews chapter 2, note with me there in verse 1, and let's read down through verse 4. Because in the end, it, it, it shows us that the lessons that we are learning here from Belshazzar are important to our life today. Notice he says there, and we'll switch it over for those viewing at home. He says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard. Go back to what we've been looking at here. Lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, example, Belshazzar, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You know, so if, if we look back to, to the people of old and none of them escaped, then what makes us think we can escape if we neglect? But so many people do. So many uh, people think that God is, uh, they uh, give him uh, this ability to do nothing but love. True. And, and you know, he's a punishing. And, uh, it, you know, it's a dreadful thing to yeah. fall into the hands of, of a living God. Of a living God. That's it's, right. Uh, you know, we need to have fear with our love for God. It needs to be, it needs to be based on adoration, respect, fear. There's just so many things that we need to uh, attribute to God other than just His ability to love us because that's so great. His love for us is so great that some people are swayed into thinking that, that, he, can't, that he can't punish. That's right. That's, that's a good point. It's been, yeah, we know that He's a just God. Mm -hmm. and he's not biased that's true. toward good or evil in terms of judging us. Right. But he's a just God who will judge mm -hmm. fairly good and evil. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. The only true fair judge. Yeah. And everything yeah. unbiased, fair judge. That's right. Ms. Fed? Well, we as the human race understand the <coughs> parent child relationship. Mm -hmm. And we realize mm -hmm. that you have to punish children to get their attention sometimes. Right. But they never want to associate that with our father mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No. They sure don't. They sure don't. All right. Look at verse 29 then. The last thing we find is Belshazzar gave the command. They clothed Daniel with purple, put a chain of gold around his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom, which, of course, never happened. 
<laughs> because he's about to die. Belshazzar is that night. He's about to 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 die. Okay. Um, let's see. How far did we we read down to twenty eight, didn't we? Or twenty nine? Well, no. All right. Let's start in verse thirty there, Miss Karen. Would you mind reading for us? Well, I'll just read thirty to the end of the chapter. Okay. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Okay. So we jump back here to verse 30, right at the very end of this chapter here. That, as was stated a while ago, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, were slain. I mean, that was it. No further, op no opportunity, nothing beyond that point. His decree about Daniel being the third ruler, you know, was, it was empty. Empty, because that night the throne was going to be taken away from him. And then we, what, who enters into the picture was a fellow by the name of Darius the Mede. He received the kingdom being about 62 years old. And uh, there's some interesting history about that, and we'll probably take a little more time next week to kind of talk about that, because when we open up into chapter 6, we open up now under the reign of Darius. You know, and Daniel's interaction here with, with King Darius. And... Uh, and just so many interesting things there. Chapter 7, we'll jump back to Belshazzar for a little bit um, in regards to um, a dream that Daniel's about to have. Chapter 8, it will jump back again to the reign of Belshazzar in the third year. And, uh, and then chapter 9, we come back to the first year of Darius' son. So it's kind of a collection of writings on the part of Daniel. And uh, some of what we're going to be reading has to do strictly with visions that God gave Daniel. And dreams. Others will deal directly with the individuals, though. All right, so any thoughts or comments about this? Any thoughts? All right, let's take a few minutes and kind of walk through the questions here. Okay. I'm going to Questions are over Daniel chapter 5 there. Let's look at the first one. Who made a great feast for a thousand of his lords? Belshazzar, yeah, Belshazzar did. All right, that was an easy one. All right, number two. Who drank, with, who drank from the gold vessels that had been brought from the temple in Jerusalem? That's right. That's right. Look at there at verse 2 there. He identifies the kings, as y'all said, the lords as well, and the wives, and his concubines. They were going to all drink from them. Maybe verse 3. Verse 3. Yeah. Nine. Then they brought the gold vessels, and the king and his lords, wives, exactly. Drink from that. Verse 3. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. Number 3. What troubled the king enough so as to cause his countenance to change? His thoughts. The proclamation. Okay, you have there a couple of things here. Look there, we have the finger writing on the wall in verse 5. But then verse 6, then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him. That would do it to you. You know, if a giant finger appeared on the wall and started writing some words, at that point he probably began to remember, what was this I heard about someone named Daniel? And, you know, he began to think about these things. Okay. And again, that pure, pure supposition... If part of this party they were throwing was in a way of trying to appeal to the false gods yeah. to try to help them, you can kind of imagine that this was not a good omen to see a writing on the wall such as this. It sounds like it was bad enough he had to have a hip replacement. Yeah. Yeah, hip replacement. <laughs> Verse 6 there. So the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, number four. He was scared to death. Oh, he, right. was. <laughs> he was. He was scared to death. He, he was going down. He screamed. Yeah. He just... <laughs> it, it, it literally frightened him. Yeah. yeah. Was All right, number four. Was King Belshazzar's wise men able to read the writing on the wall? No. 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 They were not able to read it. All right, number five there. Who told King Belshazzar about Daniel? What's that? The queen. The queen. You know, there's another interest too in, in the time of Esther. 
where the queen interceded in behalf yeah. of the Jews with the king who was going to, who would not even see me. That's right. That's a good point. She, she saved her people. Yeah. That's right. Um, and he should have listened. Maxine, this may be what the, uh, that one commentary you referenced was talking about. Um, the queen here maybe not being his wife, but being Nebuchadnezzar's wife, and still being queen, potentially. All right, let's see. So, number six. Uh, Adam Clark says that, uh, that she was the widow of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Puts her with that. Yeah. Um, and that would make sense because, you know, why would Belshazzar's wife, if she was queen, have great knowledge of Daniel? It would make more sense than Nebuchadnezzar's wife would have. All right, let's see. So, number six, what did Daniel say God had given King Nebuchadnezzar? It goes on to say that she was also the sister of Darius the Mede and Anne of Cyrus. I missed that. It says that she was the sister. So, Nebuchadnezzar's wife was the sister of Darius the Mede and the aunt of King Cyrus. Which isn't too far fetched. I mean, because you think about, it, we're still talking about people from the same region, you know, as far as you know, in, in their um, where they where they all live. Tell me how, Dar how old Darius was. Yeah, well, that's right. He, he was uh, exactly okay. probably a similar age of Nebuchadnezzar for you. Royals have always done this. Look at the British monarchy; they're related to everybody in Europe. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> They've always done it. Yeah. Intermarriage between families, their cousins, and all the rest of it. So that's not unusual. Right. That that's a good point. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts on that? All right. Let's see. Number six. What did Daniel say God had given King Nebuchadnezzar? The kingdom, the majesty, glory, and honor. Oh, yeah. He gave him the kingdom, gave him majesty, and gave him glory and honor. Had given to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. So, Number seven, then. He says, according to Daniel's charge, what had King Belshazzar not done? Exactly. He had not listened to what he had heard, and therefore he had not humbled his heart before God. Okay? Any thoughts? All right, let's look at number eight. Explain King Belshazzar's sin as stated in verse 26, or 23 there. What, what does 23 say that Belshazzar had done? What had he not glorified God? He lifted himself okay. above God. Uh, he had, start with that, he had lifted himself up against the Lord of Heaven. Mm -hmm. Lifted himself up there. And then on time, and, and, and in the course of doing that, or the, the way that he did that, I should say, is that they brought the vessels of his house in for them to drink from and to praise their false gods with these. Okay, now let's see the last, number nine and number ten. Number nine, what are the meanings of the following words which the hand wrote on the wall? I don't mean the, the definition of the word themselves, but the meaning as explained by Daniel, beginning with Mene. Yes, he says that God has numbered your kingdom. And his, and his days will be numbered. And his days will be numbered, that's right. Number, all right the next one, Tekel, means what? Okay. You've been weighed in the balance, and of course you've been found wanting. And then Uparsin, a variation of the word Perez, what does that mean? Divided. Yeah. So your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Okay? In fact, the word Perez means Persians. Yeah. Um, and then number 10, what happened to King Belshazzar and his kingdom? That's right. That's right. When it says his kingdom, he's talking about his reign. You know, his reign over the kingdom. Um, and no longer would it be the great kingdom of Babylon. It would now be the great kingdom of the Persians, and of the Medes. And it's uh, an interesting speculation. We'll, we'll get to any thoughts before we do. You, should, you always have that look when you have a thought. Damn. <laughs> no. um, it's, it's an interesting... This kind of takes us away from our study here a little bit. But in, in the story of the wise men that came to, to, to want to see the, the new king that had been born, what did the wise men know that brought them 
to what's that? Okay, all right. They, they 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 knew about the star, but what else did they know? Why? What got these wise men to venture on such a long journey to see this baby? Messianic prophecies. Okay, they had access to prophecies. Now, where did these wise men come from? The East. The East. Some scholars say they came from the area of Persia, of Persia, and so the 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 the, the the theory is among some, how would the wise men from Persia have knowledge of the king of the Jews that would be born? Prophecies. Well, it's one speculation is some of these wise men could have been students of those that had been students of Daniel. You think about Daniel, surely during this time he would have been teaching, not sitting as a hermit, not doing anything. If Daniel had been sharing the prophecies not only that he had, but it had been written regarding the coming of the Messiah. Although, bear in mind, though, during the time of Daniel, uh, when Daniel was living, some of the minor prophets had not yet been written, but others had. And so the, the theory is that Daniel taught these prophecies, and they were passed down. And finally, during the time period when Jesus was born, the wise men had access to these and came with them. Well, based his nature... He had an opportunity because the last verse of chapter uh, 6 says David, Daniel prospered. Yes. So he was free to do what he wanted to do, uh, not unlike Paul when he was in prison. Right. He, right. he was free to teach. And w based on his, on what we know about him, I can't imagine he would be a hermit yep. and not teach. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, wise <laughs> captors always learn from their captives. That's true. That was to bolster you, themselves. You have to know uh, a person in order to rule over them. Exactly. Which might explain why Sirius was so willing to let the people return home, mm -hmm. to let the Jews go back to their home. And what, what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all stood uh, studying uh, with Daniel, where they, they would all converse, so it possibly mm -hmm. yep. they spread as a lot of. That's a good point. That is an excellent point. There's, there's no doubt that they were teaching as well as Daniel, telling others about it. That's an excellent point. Right. And how many people there uh, learned quicker than the rulers did? Yeah. You know, that saw these miracles and said, wait a minute, I'm not paying attention to him anymore. Here's where the real true power is right here. So uh, there's no telling how many people saw all these things happen and and understood better than did their rulers. leaders. Yeah. It's a good point. It's a good point. All right, any other thoughts? Any comments? Okay. I tell you what let's do. We'll go ahead and pull the class to a close this morning. We'll start next we'll start chapter six first next week. And um, when we get into chapter six there, it's um, <coughs> just another um, well, chapter six, I'm drawing a blank is about the lines. Then, <laughs> um, one thing to keep, one thing we have to keep in mind is that when we, some of the things we will read about chapter six, Daniel's still not his young self. Daniel's a good bit older now. You know, we don't, we're not sure how. We made some guesstimates based on when Belshazzar's kingdom fell. They can roughly date that with the time period and when they went. So we have probably have a decent idea. We'll look at that a little bit next week. Okay, I appreciate everyone coming out this morning. And um, tonight at 7.30 at scripturalway.org, we will have the broadcast for tonight. And appreciate those who are watching online. If you're sick, hope you get feeling better. And um, Robin's not feeling too much. She's a little bit under the weather. We're just trying to get a few things done. She had the boys in the house. And so Hannah, Hannah went off with Sarah, and so she thought she would just kind of keep them reined in and, and be productive there with that. That so. would be wise. <laughs> That's right. The boys aren't going to help. Oh, no, no. <laughs> well, they might. You, you never know. It's, there's always hope. <laughs> hope springs eternal, doesn't it? Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone. Let's go ahead and have our word of prayer. Dale, would you mind leading us in that prayer? Our most loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for this privilege we have to be able to come together to be with brothers and sisters in Christ and share a common love to with thee and to be able to study thy word and have a better understanding of those things you expect us to do as your children. 
We ask, Father, that as we leave this place today, that we might not leave our Christianity here, but the world might always see Christ in us through our words and our actions. We ask also, Father, that you be with those of our members who are physically sick, that they might be restored to their health. And we have some who are traveling, that they might have a safe journey and be returned to us. And we ask that you would continue to be with our brother Lansing, that he might have his health restored to him, that he can continue to be the leader that he's been and serve thee as you would have him do so. We ask, Father, that you would help us to recognize that all good things come from thee and that we might not do any thing that would bring any shame or reproach upon thee or upon the church. These things bless in Jesus Christ's holy name.